Section 22 of Astounding Stories 12, December 1930 By Various This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ape Men of Zlotli by David R. Sparks Chapter 12 As they marched rapidly, the ape woman who called herself Gori succeeded in making them understand that most of the ape tribes, commanded by the Duca and his cacique, were assembled in the central community toward which they were heading that grave danger of some sort threatened Naida, and that the need for haste was great. But what the danger was the two girls could not understand. "'We can't make out what is going to happen, what they plan to do to-night,' Ivana whispered at last to Kirby. "'All Gori says is that we must rescue Naida and take her away, and must take the Duca away so that he cannot influence the men any more, and she keeps repeating that we must hurry.' "'And you can't find out what we must rescue Naida from?' Havana shook her head. "'I'm afraid we're facing something of an appalling nature, as dangerous to ourselves as to Naida, but I know nothing more.' By the time the silver glow which corresponded to moonlight flooded the jungle, Gori had left the open trail, and was leading them across country which humans could not have negotiated without the guidance she offered. Advancing cautiously always, she stopped for long seconds at a time to reconnoiter, shifting her huge ears about and changing their shape twitching her nostrils, and glancing hither and thither with bright little eyes. Sometimes they passed immense spike-tipped flowers ten feet in diameter, with fleshy yellow leaves which gave out a nauseating stench. Vines with long recurved thorns and blossoms of deep scarlet laced the undergrowth together, and made passing dangerous. Fireflies drifted past, and all above and about them flapped moths as big as bats. Kirby, his clothes almost torn from his body, sweat pouring from every pore, heard the labored breathing of the girls and wondered how they could hang on. But they did, and after a long time Gori, halting in the midst of a slight clearing, held up a warning hand. A queer sensation came over Kirby. As he stared and listened, he realized that the twinkles he saw far ahead were not fireflies, as he had thought, but lights. In the frosted moon-glow, Nini and Ivana drew close, and Kirby clasped their hands and pressed them for a second. Too tired to exult further he was, even though they seemed close to their goal of goals. Gori swung her hairy arm in a signal, and with rifles clasped carefully they began to advance. When, five minutes later, they stood in the heart of a rank glade beyond which they could see nothing, Gori spoke to the two girls in her creaking whisper, and Nini laid a restraining hand on Kirby's. We have gone as far as Gori dares. She says we must climb a tree here and watch what will go on in a clearing just beyond this thicket. And we still don't know what we're getting into, Kirby muttered. But at any rate they had reached the end of their march. Exultation did come to Kirby now, but still he was too completely fagged as were both girls to give much sign. Gori pointed to a tree some fifty feet away which shot up to a great foliage-crowned height. They moved toward it, and in a moment were climbing. Gori first, the girls after her, and Kirby last. "'Here we are,' Ivana presently whispered, at the same time drawing herself out on a limb just beneath one on which Gori and Nini had crawled. Kirby found himself hedged in by tassellated leaves through which he could not see. The foliage thinned, however, and soon Ivana halted, perched herself in a comfortable position. Kirby, making himself at ease beside her, and seeing that Nini and Gori were in place, turned his eyes slowly expectantly downward. At first all that he saw from his bird's-eye perch was a circular clearing two hundred yards across, which was surrounded on all sides by lowering jungle. In the exact center of the circle, like a splotch of ink on gray paper, there gaped a deep hole which might have measured six feet in diameter. Around this hole eight poles as tall and stout as telephone poles stood up in bristling array. The moonlight showed that the whitish earth of the clearing was tamped smooth as though thousands of creatures had danced or walked about there for centuries, but not a living form was visible. A grunt of disappointment escaped Kirby after that one look. When he looked beyond the clearing, however, a change came to his feelings. A quarter of a mile away lights were twinkling, the same ones which had been visible on the last stretch of the journey, and the moonlight touched the little conical roofs of fully two hundred huts of the ape people. No sound was audible save the soughing of night wind in the trees, the shrilling of insects. Nevertheless, there stole over Kirby all at once a feeling that the great ape village was crowded to overflowing. What was more, he felt himself touched by an eerie sensation. 
familiar these days, of evil to come. Ivana, seated with her rifle across her knees, stirred on the limb beside him. Oh, she whispered suddenly, I am afraid of this place. Kirby took her hand. I know. Maybe it is the sensation of all the legions of the apes herded together so silently in their village. I wish we knew what to expect from them. I wish— But he broke off, and called softly to Nini on the limb above. She looked down with a drawn expression about her mouth. "'Are you all right?' Kirby whispered. "'Yes, but—well, are both of you all right? Gory says we have reached here in time, but I—' A gasp of uneasiness escaped her and Kirby heard Ivana echo it. "'There is something about that black, silent hole out there in the clearing, and about those poles sticking up like fangs that makes me terribly, terribly afraid. Oh, what are they planning? Where is Naida? What are they going to do to her?' Kirby whistled in a low key. He had not thought about the black hole in the clearing. "'Hm,' he muttered. "'That's interesting. Ivana, Nini, what do you suppose—' But he got no answer. Gory's twitching lips grimaced them to silence. The next instant the stillness of the night was hurled aside by a howling, gurgling shout from a hundred, a thousand hysterically distended ape throats. With the sickening sound came from the village the sullen roaring of drums. Ten minutes later a Kirby, who was cold with apprehension and wonder, looked down from his leaf-crowned height at such a spectacle as he knew human eyes had never seen before. The shouting had died away. The drums were silenced. Crammed into the clearing, their foul, hairy bodies packed close together, the silver light glinting against rolling red eyes and grinning white teeth, stood fully a thousand apes. Once the first tumult of shouting in the village had died, they had come on in silence and in orderly procession. Those who bore the drums, huge gourds with heads of stretched skin, had formed a line entirely around the outer diameter of the circular clearing. Then others, lugging vats of a dark, heady-smelling liquor, had deposited their burden beside the drums, and formed a second circle. The balance of the thousand had crowded itself together as best it might, leaving bare the center of the clearing with its black hole and fangs of poles. Kirby, looking down at these legions, did not wonder that cold sweat wetted his back. Capable of thinking about only one thing, Naida, he was trying with all his strength not to think. Ivana, her face blanched in the light which filtered their camouflage of leaves, sat rigid, her hands locked about her cold rifle. On the branch above, Nini and Gori were as still as mummies. No one had spoken since the vanguard of apes had appeared, but at last Nini leaned close to Kirby. "'Have you any idea of what all this means?' A draft of hot night air carried up a stench of drunkenness and the goaty odor of massed animal bodies. No, Kirby whispered. I suppose, from Gory's having brought us here, that Naida is going to appear somehow. We've simply got to trust that Gory knows what she is about. But listen, Ivana suppressed a shudder. Suppose they should bring Naida here presently to force her to take part in some ceremony at which we can only guess. Gory, who thinks we can work miracles, supposes we can rescue Naida. But I—I'm not so certain. Is there anything we can do? It was exactly that question which had made Kirby fight to keep himself from thinking. His face turned gray before he answered, but answer he did, finally. "'Yes, there is one thing we can do, Ivana. We've got to be frank with each other, and so far this is the only thing I've been able to figure out. If Naida is brought here, and they make any move to harm her or torture her, we can, and we will, shoot her quickly before harm or pain comes.' A grim silence settled once more. During the last miles of march in the jungle there had persisted in Kirby's heart the hope that there would be at least something favorable in whatever situation they might encounter. His spirits were so low now that he dared not speak again. Amongst the noiseless sea of ape-men below them came, every now and again, a little ripple of motion as some anthropoid shadow fell out of his place, approached the liquor vats, and swilled down the black brew a quart at a gulp but mostly there was little commotion. Ivana drew a sibilant breath and said that she wished something would happen. "'I wish,' Kirby answered tensely, "'that we knew what is going to happen.' But the nightmare waiting was not to go on forever. Kirby leaned forward and pointed. It was only instinct that had made him know action must come. For a second, 
No change in the expression of the ape-men, no movement in their crammed ranks, was visible. Then, however, a queer subdued grunting rumbled deep down in many throats, and those who had faced the hundred-foot space in the center of the clearing squatted down on their hams. In the back of the crowd necks were craned. The stronger shoved the weaker in an effort to get a better view of the cleared stage, and a few ape-men who had been drinking hurried on unsteady legs to their places. "'The drums!' Kirby whispered then. With almost military precision the scores of leather-faced creatures who had led the procession into the clearing clasped the skin-headed gourds to their shaggy bellies, and stood with free arm raised as though awaiting a signal. Nini moved in her position, and Kirby felt Ivana shiver and edge close to him. From the front rank of the crowd there sprang up a great male creature with the face of a gargoyle and the body of a jungle giant. Just once he reeled on his feet as though black alcohol had befuddled him, then he steadied himself, flung both arms above his head, and rolled out a command which burst upon Kirby's ear like thunder. It was as if the whole cavern of the lower world, and the whole of the round earth itself, had been rocked uneasily, dreadfully, by the bellowing, crashing explosion of the drums. Maddened by the turmoil he had let loose, the gargoyle-faced giant ape-man leered about him with bloodshot, drunken eyes, and beat on his cicatrized chest with massive fists. Suddenly he let out a bellow. Straight up into the air he sprang in a wild leap. When he came down he was dancing and the portentous, the sickeningly mysterious ceremony for which such solemn preparation had been made, was begun. Kirby drew a rasping breath, knowing that there must be some definite reason for the dance having begun just when and as it had. He looked beyond the solitary dancing giant, on beyond the crowded legions of the apes, toward the village. There, where the main trail from the community approached the clearing, he saw precisely the thing which he had both hoped desperately and dreaded terribly to find. Headed directly toward the clearing, moving down the trail with slow majestic pace, came a procession headed by a bodyguard of ape-men and augmented by other men whose nakedness was covered by unmistakable, unforgettable priestly robes of grey. All at once the ape-people in the clearing began to scuffle apart opening a lane down which the procession might pass to the central stage with its dancer, its ink-spot orifice, and its fangs of tall poles. Kirby, watching the congregation, watching the majestic approach of gray robes through the night, wiped away from his forehead a sweat of fear. "'I think,' Nini called in a voice pitched high to outsound the drums, "'that the Duca is with them.' Yes, Kirby pointed jerkily, in the middle of the procession, there, surrounded by his cacique. The Duca. Yet his approach did not hold Kirby. Directly behind the priests were emerging now from the jungle a new company of ape-men. Squinting his eyes, Kirby saw that two of them were lugging on a pole across their shoulders a curious burden, a sort of monstrous bird-cage of barked withes, crouched on the floor of the cage in a little motionless white heap. But Kirby closed his eyes. Ivana, cowering against him, gulped as though she were going to be sick. Nini leaned down from above and looked at them with dilated eyes. Although none of them spoke, all knew that they had found Naida at last. Kirby was the first to pull himself up. Opening his eyes, he stared long at the white-gowned, motionless shape within the cage. Next summing up the whole situation, the cage surrounded by an armed band, the clearing crammed with a thousand ape-men, he shook his head. Afterward he made a quick movement with his hands. Ivana, seeing that movement, seeing the expression on his face, started out of her daze. No, no! Oh, there must be some other way out for her! There must! Her cry, half a shriek, did not change Kirby's look. What he had done with his hands was to throw a shell into the chamber of his rifle. Now he held the rifle grimly, ready to carry it to his shoulder. The procession with the bodyguard of ape-men at its head, the renegade duca and his cacique following next, and the cage bringing up the rear, advanced relentlessly down the lane to the central stage. The gargoyle-faced ape-man, who held the stage alone, danced with increasing wildness, writhing, twisting with weird suppleness. Upon the dancing giant the procession bore down, and before him it finally halted. The halt left the duca and the king ape facing each other, and the ape ended his dance. After each had given a salute made by raising their arms, both duca and the king ape 
turned to face the creatures who were standing with the cage slung across their shoulders, whereupon the bearers of the cage advanced with it until they stood between two of the tall poles. There, facing the ominous hole in the center of the clearing, with a pole on either side of them, the ape-man lowered the cage to the ground. Kirby felt his last hope and courage ebbing. Now he noticed that each pole was equipped with a rope which passed through a hole near its top, like a thread through the eye of a needle, and while he stared at the dangling ropes, the ape-men made one end of each fast to a ring in the top of the cage. The next instant they leaped back, and began to heave at the other end of the lines. From the drums came a quicker pounding, a more head-splitting volume of thunder. Over all the ape people who watched the show passed a shiver of what seemed to be whole-souled, ecstatic satisfaction. Slowly, as the two ape-men heaved hard, the cage swung off the ground, and slowly rose higher and higher into the moonlit air. When finally the thing hung high above the heads of the multitude, swaying midway between its tall supports, the ape-men who had done the hoisting fastened their lines to cleats on the poles. Then they turned to the duca and the giant king who stood behind them, executed a queer lumbering bow, and fell back to the rear. The next moment it seemed as though every creature in the clearing, men and those who were only half-men, had gone crazy. The king flung himself into the air as if he were a mass of bounding rubber. Following his lead, the whole assembly let out howls that drowned even the drums, and then began to sway, to squirm, to leap, even as their king was doing before them. The cacique and the duca joined in the madness of foul dancing as heartily as any there. Their eyes were flaming, their long robes flapping, their beards streaming. On his perch in the tree Kirby muttered an oath which was lost, swept away like a breath, in the shrieking turmoil of sound. Then he turned to Ivana. They brought Naida here to sacrifice her. But why? Ivana's sweet face was frozen in lines of terror. I've been able to guess what was going to happen to her. But sacrifice, why will it be that? Don't you see? Looking up to include Nini, Kirby found his hands quivering against his rifle. It is easy to understand. In the temple yesterday what the Duca hoped to do was kidnap most or all of the girls for the ape people. But he was able to get only Naida. The first result was that the ape men started to quarrel over the one girl. From what Gori says, trouble started on all sides at once. It became inadvisable to let Naida live. So the Duca, in his shrewdness, planned a sacrifice. By sacrificing Naida, he rids himself of a source of contention amongst the ape-men. He also hopes his act will win favor from his gods, and make them help him when he is ready to launch a new attempt to capture all the girls. Ivana and Nini looked at each other, then at Kirby, and horror was etched deeper into their faces. "'I think,' gulped Ivana, "'that you are right. I begin to understand.' Nini leaned close to them. Tell us, then, how this sacrifice is to be made." Silent at that, Kirby presently made a heavy gesture toward the maelstrom of howling, leaping animals below them. I couldn't guess at first. Now I think I can. They have placed her in that cage and swung it high above the black hole you were afraid of. What can that mean except that she is to be offered to—to— to it was a monstrous theory which had stunned his hope and courage, and to voice the thing in words was too gruesome. His bare suggestion, however, made Ivana pass a hand limply over her forehead, and look at him with blank stricken eyes. Nini tottered so uncertainly that Gori, who had remained motionless and silent throughout, had to steady her with muscular arms. If it was impossible for Kirby to utter his fears aloud, he had no need to speak to make them understood. And—and and we can do nothing? Nini choked at last. You can see for yourself how she is surrounded. If we had been able to get her sooner, we might have done something. Now— Kirby's voice trailed off, and he gave an agonized look at his rifle. The terrific dance in the clearing was going forward with madness which increased second by second. It had been a general debauch at first, with the whole thousand of the apes bellowing and squirming. Now a change was becoming apparent. Red eyes, which had caught the glare of ultimate madness, focused upon the cacique, the duca, and the great king, all of whom were swaying together on the central stage. As they looked, the horde of ape-men broke loose with a heightened frenzy of noise and movement too overwhelming for Kirby to follow. He leaned forward, making an effort to see what actions of duca and king 
could be so influencing the congregation, and then he saw. The one with hair-covered giant's body and evilly grimacing face, the other with white robes and whipping silver hair, were definitely emulating the motions of a serpent. It was as if the angles and joints had disappeared from their bodies. They were become gliding lengths of muscle as swift as loathsome in their supple dartings and coilings as any snake lashing across the expanses of primeval jungle, lost in what they did, unconscious of the nightmare demoniac legion before which they danced. They had eyes only for the empty, ominous hole beneath Naida's cage. As they circled the hole, drawing ever and ever closer to it, they opened and closed their arms with the motion of great serpent jaws biting and striking. "'God in heaven!' Kirby cried in a voice which shrilled with horror and then broke. It was not alone the Duca's dance which had wrung the shout from him. As Nina and Ivana shrieked and cowered, as Gori twitched, gasped, buried her head in trembling arms, Kirby knew that Naida was fully aware of what was going on, and had been, perhaps, from the beginning. Slowly, numbly, she raised herself from her huddled position, rose to her knees, and clutching with despairing hands at the sides of her cage, looked out from between the bars. The king and Duca edged closer to the hole until they were dancing upon its very brink. From that position they stared down into the depths, their faces tense and strained. And then their look became radiant, exalted, joyous. Suddenly the Duca leaped back. He shrieked something at the gargoyle ape and they flung their arms high in a commanding, mighty signal which was directed across the nightmare legion of ape-men to the drums. As Kirby winced in expectancy, the drums ceased to roar. Over the night smashed a hideous concussion of silence, deafening, absolute, and the ape-men, all of them, and the duca, his cacique, and the king ceased to dance. As if a whirlwind had hurled them, the cacique scattered in all directions, the duca, having already leaped back from the gaping orifice, suddenly turned and ran with blurred speed over to the slobbering, deadly, still front rank of the congregation. An instant later the king crouched down beside him, and the whole stage was left bare and deserted. Kirby gave one look at Naida, found her staring down, deeper and deeper down, into the hole which yawned beneath her so blackly. Then Kirby lowered his eyes until he, too, stared at the opening. Amidst the pressing silence there stole from the earth an uneasy sound as of some immense thing waking and stirring. Came a hissing note as of escaping steam. The tribes of the ape-men waited in silent rapture. Kirby saw Naida still looking down, and felt Ivana crouch against him, fainting. He held his rifle tighter and continued to stare. Something red, like two small flames, licked up above the edge of the pit. Then Kirby gasped and all but went limp. Up and out into the moonlight slid a glistening white lump that moved from side to side and licked at the night with flickering black and red-tipped forked tongue. The glistening white lump was the head of Quetzalcoatl, buried god of the people of the temple. It was wider and bigger than an elephant's, and the round snake body could not have been encircled by a man's two arms. Kirby guessed at the probable length of the serpent in terms of hundreds of feet. Sick, numb, he glanced at Naida, who was still staring silently, and hitched his rifle half up to his shoulder. But he did not look down the sights yet. Although it was time, and more than time, that he fired, he would not do it until the last possible second, when nothing else remained. Slowly from the hole slid a fifteen or twenty-foot column of the body, and Quetzalcoatl, thus reared, looked about him with a pair of eyes immense and not like snakes' eyes, but heavily lidded and lashed eyes that stared in a wise, evil way, eyes glittering and round and black as ink. After a time the mouth opened in a silent snarl, showing great white fangs and recurved scimitars of teeth. The head was snow-white, leprous in its scabby, scaly roughness, with here and there a patch of what looked like greenish fungus. From the rounded body trailed a short, unnatural, sickening growth of feathers. Old and evil and very wise the feathered serpent seemed, as his forked tongue flickered in and out, and he stared at the ape-horde, who stared back silently. He seemed in no hurry to devote his attention to the cage set forth for his delectation. The black eyes rolled beneath their lashes, staring now at the duca in his robes, and again at the huddled ape-people. But after ghastly seconds, Quetzalcoatl at last had seen enough. 
Again the moonlight glinted against scimitar teeth as the great white puffy mouth yawned in its silent snarl. Quetzalcoatl reared his head a little higher, slid further from his hole, and then looked up at the dangling cage of barked withes. In Kirby's mind stirred cloudily a remembrance of moments in the past, the feel of Naida's first kiss, her look as they advanced to the altar in the temple. Then he saw things as they were now, with Naida surrounded by all the tribes of the apes, and with Quetzalcoatl staring from beneath heavily lidded lashes at the whiteness of her. Suddenly Kirby stirred to free his shoulder of Ivana's supine weight against it, and he made himself look down his rifle. He let the breath half out of his lungs, and nursed the trigger. But he did not fire. All at once he started so violently that he almost hurtled from the tree. Suddenly, trembling, he lowered his rifle. "'Oh, thank God!' he yelped in the silence of the night. The idea which had transformed him was perhaps the conception of a lunatic, but it was still an idea, and offered a chance. Again Kirby peered down his rifle, but he no longer aimed at Naida. As Quetzalcoatl lifted white fangs, Kirby aimed deliberately at him, and turned loose his fire. With the first shot the serpent lurched back from the cage, snapped his jaws, and closed evil black eyes. From one lidded socket squirted dark blood, as a second and third shot crashed into the cavernous fanged mouth, and others ripped into the flat skull, Quetzalcoatl seemed dazed. His head wavered back and forth, and his hiss filled the night, but he did nothing. But all at once Kirby felt that he was going to do something in a second, and a great calm came upon him. He quickly jammed home a fresh clip of shells. "'Nini! Ivana! Fire at the serpent! Give him everything you've got! Do you understand? Fire! He thinks that the ape people have hurt him, and he will be after them in a second. If we have any luck, he will do to them what we never could have done, and maybe destroy himself at the same time. Me? I'm going down there and get Naida, now!' End of chapter 12